<laughs> okay. Welcome to the Bloomington Rotary's mm -hmm. weekly celebration of service for December 15th, 2020, last meeting of the year. And I'm your current president, Ashley Wesley. Thank you for being here. Natalie, could you please show the flag graphic for 15 seconds of respectful silence? We ask that everyone remain on mute and take this time to personally reflect. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Dave Meyer who will be offering our reflection. Dave. Thank you, President Ashley. I'd like to reflect on today on my pandemic hobby. In June, only three months into my pandemic experience, I decided to take up a socially distanced hobby, fossil collecting. A little internet research uncovered that southeastern Indiana has some of the richest fossil beds in the world, containing many creatures like this shellfish and this coral. The time captured there covers about 490 through 445 million years ago. It's known as the Ordovician period, a time fully 215 million years before the dinosaurs. The Ordovician was a time of bountiful and expanding life in the oceans. Learning about this period has been very engaging. In addition to stomping around hunched over numerous rocky road cuts, I've read almost everything I could find about this period. It's almost like being a kid again. It's funny how a hobby taken up to escape one challenging reality can force one to reckon with another. Mentally escaping the threat of a global pandemic caused me to confront an even greater global threat, our climate crisis. The Ordovician ended with the second largest mass extinction event contained in the fossil record a three million, long period, a million year long period that extinguished 85% of all living species. While scientific research continues on the causes of this great extinction, it's agreed that it was started by an abrupt change in global climate. We live in the Anthropocene period and the Earth's climate is again changing rapidly. Anthropocene means dominated by man. Last month was the warmest November ever recorded planted wide. 2020 is expected to be the warmest year on record when it ends. It's largely up to us to determine how and when the Anthropocene period will end and how habitable a planet our children and grandchildren will inherit. Fortunately, not everything is gloomy on the climate front. This year, it's estimated that 90% of all electricity projects across the world will come from clean energy. Last year, the investment in new wind and solar was more than three times that of fossil fuels. It's reported that clean energy is now cheaper than nearly 80% of all US coal plants and the price continues to drop. Governments and citizens are not standing still. Yesterday, Xi Jinping, China's leader, said that by 2030, China would reduce its carbon intensity by over 65%. And on Friday, the European Union reached an uh, agreement with its member nations to slash emissions by 55% over the next decade. President-elect Biden has promised to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement on January 20th, and young people of Greta Thunberg's generation are marching all over the world on climate and demanding change. It's no longer a partisan issue for people of her generation. They understand acutely that they will live 
on the planet that we leave them. As our difficult year winds down, we must continue to wear masks, wash hands, and socially distance. But we must also prepare for our next great challenge in order to continue to protect our loved ones and our future. On a cheery note, my wife and I would like to wish all of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Lastly, let me show you what Cindy is doing with some of our fossil corals for, uh, for Christmas, making fossil Santas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave. That is just delightful, Cindy. I love those. Um, okay. We have a few guests with us today. Um, I see Anne Bright has joined us. Welcome, Anne. Always a welcome guest and a guest of many would claim her, um, but I think she's mainly a guest of Jim Bright. And my friend Caitlin Lippa is here, our friend, Pastor Rotarian of our club. I hope she joins us regularly. Welcome. Thank you for coming back again. And Randy Willers here, District Secretary, Rotary Club of Evansville. Welcome again, Randy. Am I missing anyone else? We had a couple of prospective guests and I don't see them on the screen. But if you're here and I haven't mentioned you, speak up. Okay, I think that's everyone. So you all know what to do if you wanna know more about Rotary. I think we're covered, um, but we'd love to talk to you anytime. Thanks to our producers, Michael Shermis, Natalie Blaze, Sally Gaskell, and Aaron Davis. And our roundabout reporter for this week is Jim Bright. We have lots of birthdays because this is our last meeting of the year. We're gonna cover the rest of this year's birthdays. Amy Osajima is a Christmas baby, December 25th. Katie Beck, December 27th. Anne Wren, December 27th. John Berida, December 28th. Lee Witt, December 29th. And George Boone, December 30th. Happy birthday, everyone. And membership anniversaries, Peggy Frisbee, 23 years, Wendell St. John, one year, and Paul Hazel, 34 years as a Rotarian. So congratulations and thank you for being a part of this family. Now we have a few special celebrations that we wanna share, starting with Sally Gaskell. Thank you. Um, Ashley has asked a couple of us to reflect on whatever we wanted at uh, this last meeting of, a, of the year. As the winter solstice approaches, we notice the changes. The days of light are shorter, the darkness is longer, the weather is cold, the trees are bare, and snow is often on the ground. From the author John Matthews, the solstice is a time of quietude, of firelight and dreaming. When seeds germinate in the cold earth and the cold notes of church bells mingle with the chimes of icicles, rivers are stilled and the land lies waiting beneath a coverlet of snow. We watch the cold sunlight and the bright stars, maybe go for walks in the quiet land. All around us, the season seems to reach a standstill, a point, a point of repose. And from the Circle of Life by Joyce Rupp and Macrina Whitaker. There is a tendency to want to hurry from autumn to spring to avoid the long dark days that winter brings. Many people do not like constant days bereft of light and months filled with colder temperatures. Their spirits tire of tasting the endless gray skies. There is great rejoicing in the thought that light and warmth will soon be filling more and more of each new day. But winter darkness has a positive side to it. The winter solstice celebrates the return of hope to our land as our planet experiences the first slow turn toward greater daylight. Soon, we will welcome the return of the sun and the coming of springtime. As we do so, let us remember and embrace the positive, enriching aspects of winter's darkness. Pause now to sit in silence in the darkness of the space. Happy winter solstice. Thank you, Sally. Next up, we have Rosie the Clown to share something with us. Rosie. Thank you, Ashley, and thanks for inviting me to 
share with you a uh, holiday reflection. Uh, when I gave some thought to it, I said, the best way to, for me to reflect is to talk about Rosie the Clown. And uh, so I'm going to share a little bit with all of you. <clears throat> it's time for the holidays, a time to give cheer, joy, peace, and happiness we spread through the year. Who better can bring that than the antics of a clown Someone so funny will never let you frown. Clowning around reflects the joy in humanity. Clowns bring humor and joy that maintains your sanity. A funny looking character echoes your laughter, putting smiles on all faces. Humor follows soon after. So let's all smile and keep the wonder. The holidays are bright, a time to ponder. Send in the clowns, they will bring you bliss. Happy holidays to all a time to reminisce. Now I wanna ask, what makes a clown? What makes a clown, you may ask? Some colored hair, a costume bright, a funny red nose. What makes a clown, you may ask? It's a warm smile, a laugh that's shared, a spirit lifted to make someone glad. It's a gift of heart from the clown. This is what transforms a frown. What makes a clown, you may ask? It's all of this and nothing less. May you all enjoy a joyous, happy, healthy, and peaceful holiday season. Thanks. Thank you so much. You always bring joy to our faces and then in our hearts. Thank you. Thank Next you. up, Glenda Murray with a reading of, of the non-rhyming variety, she says. <laughs> Thank you and happy holidays to all. Someone sent me this 20 years ago and I liked it enough that I kept it. So I pulled it out and only changed a couple words, the part, the part about the family being close together. May your holidays be filled with happiness and health, good cheer and the precious warmth of family. And wonderfully amidst the giving of presents and gifts, May each one of you receive these blessings too. Happiness deep down within, serenity with each sunrise, success in every facet of your life, close and caring friends and love that never ends. Special memories of all the yesterdays, bright todays and with much to be thankful for, a path that will lead to beautiful tomorrows all through the coming year. Wishing you every joy of the season. Thank you, Glenda. And our last presentation is from Charlotte. Do we have something to share, Charlotte? You're on mute. Somehow, do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I was going to, I was trying to get a Google of a Moravian star on, on the, the um, shared, shared thing. I don't know if Michael can still do this. Yes, there is the Moravian star. The Moravian star has many points, as you can see. And it's, it's, it's a star that, that originated in Moravia, which is the northern, was the northern part of Czechoslovakia, just to the northeast of, 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 of the Czech, Bohemia, the Czechoslovakia, where, where we lived. We lived in Slovakia. The three of those countries were, were together. And Moravia is more like us, Czech than it is Slovak. But you see this star, it's a representation of the Moravian brethren or the people who lived in Moravia. Moravia had a, had a, um, Reformation earlier than, than Luther's Reformation it was Jan Hus, J A N H U S. Jan Hus broke from the Catholic Church in the early 14th century, about a hundred years before Luther. And, and, and he was ultimately burned at the stake for his heresy. He didn't have a good friend who spirited him the way as, as Luther did. But the star has many points, as you can see, it points in every direction. And, and the star has become a symbol of, of, of Christmas for many people. 
I'm told, I was told today that, that the Moravian star has all these points because it was something that was devised as a instruction for, by a teacher of geometry. And, and it's become the symbol of welcome. It's a wonderful star. It's, it hangs, it hangs apparently in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Everybody has one out of their house. And I used to have one that, that, that expanded that I got in Spain of all places. But the star next week, uh, my, I, I'm told on the 21st of, of December, Jupiter and Saturn are going to cross down in the south, southwest part of our sky early in the morning. And, and they, they will be extremely bright. And people say that that, that, that that may have been the star of Bethlehem that's part of the Christian tradition, that, that it's the conjunction of, of Jupiter and Saturn and the Moravians. So stars are part of our Christmas um, traditions, many of different, mainly Christian, but not only, and they have totally different origins, but it, it's, I love this star the many pointed star. And um, one of the things that I didn't realize, we used to have a bookstore here called Morgenstern's, which Morgenstern is, you know, Morgenstern is a morning star. And, and, and he has on his, he had on his logo, a star like this. So stars are everywhere. And our stars are in our hearts, I believe. And fortunately, Today, I feel better about, about the world than I have for a long time because, of, because people who thought they were stars have fallen and people, other stars have risen. So happy stars, everybody. Merry Christmas. I love you all. Thank you so much, Charlotte. That was winged. <laughs> you can never tell. Yes. Always. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes our special presentations. Thank you to everyone for offering those readings and reflections. It's, it's such a special time and I feel very lucky to be a part of this family with you all and I appreciate you all. We have an announcement from our ringleader, Steve Moberly about Salvation Army bell ringing. We really need some more help for this Saturday, December 19th at Kroger East. Volunteers can click on the link in the roundabout or they can call Steve directly at 812-339-8619 and he will sign you up. I'll put that number in the chat so that you can reach him if you'd like to sign up for this Saturday, but we could use four uh, shifts covered. So please consider taking one of those shifts this Saturday. And the holiday greetings are flooding in, but I still think that there's some more out there from you guys. So this Friday, I'd like to have all of your greetings so I can compile our special project to share with you all. Thank you to everyone who's given uh, me this joyful task. I really appreciated all the videos and photos and uh, can't wait to share it with you. Michael, can you show the thank you cards that we received just very quickly? I'd like to share with everybody. If you don't have them, we'll show them later. Yeah, later, I guess, because I don't have them, so. <laughs> That's fine, we need to get to our speaker anyway. So um, without further ado, Owen, would you introduce our speakers today? Thank you, President Ashley. Um, in 1986, my wife and I took a week-long trip to India and Nepal prior to attending an international communications convention in New Delhi. One of our fellow travelers on that trip, Doug Newsom from Texas Christian, spent the following year as a Fulbright professor at Osmania University in Hyderabad. In Hyderabad, she, yes, Doug is a she, met a promising young woman, Radhika Parameswaran, whose parents both had PhDs. Her late father had won an All India Best Teaching Award. Doug persuaded Radhika to come to the U.S. for graduate study. Radhika enrolled at TCU and earned an M.A. She went on to the University of Iowa, where she earned a Ph.D. In 1997, Radhika came to IU with her husband, as Doug had become her mother-in-law. Radhika has a distinguished career at IU. 
She served as chair of the journalism unit right after it became part of the media school. She has edited a volume of the International Encyclopedia of Media Studies, written two monographs, and authored numerous scholarly articles. She has been a judge for the Peabody Awards in electronic journalism. Like her father, she is an outstanding teacher. At least four times, she has won teaching awards at IU. She is a Herman B. Wells endowed professor. This year, she is a fellow in the Big Ten Academic Alliance's Academic Leadership Program, which helps professors planning to pursue careers in academic administration to develop leadership skills. Radhika has mentored more than a dozen PhD students and is much sought after as an advisor. One of them currently is Pallavi Rao, who joins her in speaking to us today. Pallavi came to IU from Manipal University on the southwest coast of India. Previously, she earned a professional master's degree in writing and communication from Deakin University in Melbourne. Already, like Radhika, she has won teaching and research awards at IU, where she is focused on studying journalism, news histories, and digital media cultures in contemporary India. This fall, she has been teaching what sounds like a very interesting topic called, We Are Extremely Online, Digital Media and Participatory Cultures. Please give a warm rotary welcome to Professor P and Dr. Tabi Rao. <laughs> Thank you all so much. We're delighted to be here. Uh, we want to start off by sharing our screen, making sure we can do that. And um, let me see, here we go. And then we can start. And can you all see the screen? I just want to make sure. Okay. Thank you so much for confirming. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And Owen, what a warm and generous and personal and such a lovely introduction of both me um, and Pallavi. It's an honor for me to do this with Pallavi. She is my dream advisee. The ones that, you know, the kind of advisee that you go, someday I will have them. There she is. So it's such a pleasure to do this with her. Um, and as, as um, uh, Owen just pointed out, we're both in the media school. And one of the things I'd like to do before we go any further is explain this, um, you know, interesting visual to you. And this is, a, this is actually kind of a digital uh, art, you know, painted by this illustrator Hanifa Abdul Hamid who is South Asian herself and lives in the US and, and came up with this very interesting um, portrait of Kamala. As you can see, this shows her very much as a hybrid sort of racial uh, personality. There's an American side of her. She's in a suit, blue suit. Um, she's um, you know got henna on her hands and she also has uh, the bindi on her forehead, kind of bringing together her different um, identities. Quickly to point out the significance of the vote for auntie, that is um, a recognition of Kamala's South Asian um, identity. And I wanna tell you all what that is. She put out a tweet, uh, you know, um, and she said, I'm a Senator, I'm a wife, I'm a momala, which is a combination of mom and Kamala and auntie. So auntie is a, comes from South Asian culture. It's a term of respect for um, you know, women of, of, of a certain age, typically middle-aged and older. Um, and some people have argued that um, you know, it could be diminishing women, but we, uh, neither Pallavi or I see it that way at all. Basically, it's a term of respect. It doesn't reduce a woman into someone, you know, who doesn't have intelligence or status. Um, you know, it's none of that because when we were growing up, aunties were all kinds of women, you know, uh, including women who were respected for their domestic skills. So, um, you know, I just wanted to quickly explain that. I also want to say that today we're here um, and my colleagues like, you know, who are in the uh, Zoom room, including Professor John Dills, Owen, 
uh, you know, uh, Professor Jim Bright and others know this. I am not in political communication. So I'm not a political scientist and neither is Pallavi, right? We are basically media scholars uh, and we're very interested in issues of racial and cultural identity. And so we're not here as experts in political communication, but rather I must say that we're here because we are just as surprised to see uh, you know, Kamala rise up in the political landscape as someone who has um, South Asian heritage. So uh, without further ado, we'll keep moving along, but I did want to explain this interesting visual. Okay. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Pallavi now. Um, We're going back and forth on the presentation, um, you know, and I think that will make it more interesting and lively for you all. So Pallavi, can you take it away? Yes, um, one of the things that we as South Asians particularly are interested in is over the last two decades, the emergence of several South Asian Americans, particularly Indian Americans uh, within American politics. And of course they stretch across the political spectrum. Here is a sample of a few uh, Indian American politicians who are Republicans. You have Bobby Jindal on the left. He's probably been here longer than most of the others. You have Ajit Pai, Pai who's the, the, the chairman of the FCC. You have um, Nikki Haley, of course, who's a former ambassador to the UN in the Trump government. And then you have Seema Verma, who heads uh, Medicare and Medicaid services right now. Um, and this is, of course, the Republican spectrum. And then to the next of that, I can click on it if you will. Oh. Um, and then, of course, you have some very well-known Democrats. You have Pramila Jaipal um, and Ami Bera, as well as the person on the right, the, the most right, who is Ro Khanna, who are all congresspersons from California. Um, and then you have the person who's third from the left, his Raja Krishnamurti, who is a senator from Illinois. So, you know, as, as South Asians uh, predominantly tend to vote Democrat, um, at least demographically from what we know, uh, despite that, they stretch across the political spectrum in terms of political representation. They exist across both parties and even within the Democrat Party, for instance, Ro Khanna and Pramila Jaipal uh, exist on the progressive spectrum. So they're becoming more visible in the political arena in really big ways in recent times. Um, you can go to the next slide. And, yeah. So what the, the, the reason we kind of, um, you know, took a very brief inventory of all these, um, you know, politicians of South Asian or Indian origin is that um, this is a new form of recognition that this community is um, gaining. And Kamala's rise has to be situated, you know, within this context, right? She's not, uh, you know, she's not sort of the lonely cowgirl on this landscape. There are others who've been rising along with her, and they are also partly responsible, you know, in terms of creating a space, right, for a candidate uh, like Kamala Harris and other, other sort of uh, candidates like her to come into this uh, uh, space. What I wanted to do here was just to quickly and very briefly summarize uh, Kamala Harris, um, you know, her um, political history and her educational history. She was a 2020 Democratic presidential candidate um, and, you know, did not go forward. But what was interesting that we didn't have a lot of time to uh, talk about was, if you all recall at that time, Tulsi Gabbard was also a Democratic present presidential candidate. And I remember being completely, um, you know, sort of uh, struck by her name because Tulsi is really an Indian name, right? It's a holy basil plant. So you had Kamala Devi Harris, right? So with a very Indian name. And then you had Tulsi Gabbard, who's not Indian, but had kind of become converted to Hinduism and was also appealing to the Indian American electorate at that time, right? And Kamala Devi literally means lotus goddess. And we wrote an essay uh, from lotus goddess to holy basil, right? And that, so that was very interesting to have these candidates with these names, right? Coming into the, in a prominent way to the uh, American sort of uh, electoral political landscape. She was a Senator from California. She was also the attorney general for California and a very quick, um, you know, her educational history, uh, she went, went, got her BA at Howard University, and then her JD uh, at University of California. So she, she has, she's very pedigreed in terms of her education, not Ivy League, which she has actually made a point of, um, you know, but um, we'll come back to this. Now, her very unusual uh, biracial background, which is what you know we want to kind of talk about today, the focus of her identity for us, is that her father, Donald Harris, um, uh, is of a black Jamaican origin. 
and her mother, uh, Shamala Gopalan, is of Indian origin. And we'll get into these more sort of, um, you know, uh, India is a huge subcontinent. And while Indians, you know, in saying we're Indian, yes, that is part of our identity. But in many ways, as you all know, this kind of homogenizes, just as saying somebody is American, you know, I could understand um, many, many years ago before I came to this country, but now I know that Americans means, um, you know, you have Texans, right? And then you have Floridans, you have all kinds of Americans, right? And so uh, Americans from the South see themselves a certain way, Americans from the North, you know, so in, the, in a similar way, Indian identity is very diverse. And her mother is a South Indian and a Tamil Brahmin. And just in terms of full disclosure, part of what we find very interesting in this that is that both of us are of that identity, right? And so to see a candidate, um, you know, with who's uh, part of our identity really resonated for us because we wanted to unpack what this means, uh, both in a scholarly way, but also in a personal way. And uh, one of the interesting things, of course, about our scholarship that, you know, it allows for us to do this, right? You take your personal identity as a starting point, but then you do more with it rather than just um, be narcissistic about it, right? So we found this very interesting. Um, Shamila's uh, father, right? So uh, this is Kamala's grandfather, was a diplomat and her and a political anti-colonial activist. Her mother was also an activist. Um, and, and just to keep in mind, the father, you know, was educated in English, spoke English fluently. Um, and so she comes from a pretty elite background on her mother's side. And I would not say elite necessarily in terms of um, economic wealth, but definitely in terms of what we would call cultural capital, you know, um, and in other ways, right, in terms of educational background. Shamila is an unusual woman herself. She migrated to the US in 1958 to get a PhD in cancer research at UC Berkeley. And that's where she actually met Donald Harris. And both of them were very involved in civil rights uh, activism and in social justice uh, and sort of anti-racism, although it was not called that at that time. This is something you know we're beginning to talk about uh, now, and so in many ways, very unusual because in May, for for women for a woman to come alone in 1958, and she was quite young, uh, you know, about 19 or 20, and without a husband, right, coming on her own, um, definitely puts her into a category of you know um, of somebody who's quite unusual and exceptional uh, in terms of her gender politics, and then for her to uh, you know. Uh, join the sorts of activism also uh, and, and that to remember she's from a STEM field it's not that she was in um, you know history or English or these fields that we typically associate with activism so this is just a little bit of uh, her background so um, the one of the points of interest as Radhika mentioned for us as media scholars is really about how media has been implicated and how Kamala's identity becomes a big part of the discourse, particularly since she's become, uh, well, particularly since she ran as a presidential candidate, and then of course uh, with her candidacy and of course now being the vice president elect. Um, the media for us are interesting because we often think of identity uh, in, in the mode of performance. Um, by this, we don't mean that it's fake or fraudulent but that identities often require us to be constantly performing them, enacting certain modes of being on a daily basis, on an everyday basis. Um, and the media, because Kamala is a political figure, especially the media become an important site where, uh, you know, you have the process of how Kamala constantly identifies and gets identified as black or Asian American or female, right? All of these have been uh, conversations that the media has both participated in, but that Kamala has also strategically, strategically sort of, you know, um, um, materialize and leverage for her own political uh, career. So uh, one of the things that we found that was interesting uh, with uh, American media discourse around Kamala's identity is, of course, that she is very significant as uh, as an African American candidate um, in the political sphere, and her her uh, selection as uh, Biden's uh, vice presidential candidate is very historic. Um, and a lot of the headlines that came out when Biden made his selection clearly reflected this. It was very much about uh, black people and black women in particular, uh, really sort of celebrating someone from their community um, becoming so politically prolific and 
of course, being the first black vice president, because this is a pretty high office um, and uh, no one who, uh, there hasn't been a black vice president before this. So several of the headlines reflected this. You had um, the fact that she was making history. Um, you had the fact that she was the first woman of color to be vice president, um, even though there were some, and this is particularly important in light of the fact that many women politicians, women of color politicians are often facing really sort of patriarchal and sexist comments uh, constantly. The, you know, the recent uh, comments around uh, Dr. Jill Biden's uh, PhD, for instance, being an example of that. Um, so Kamala's, a, a lot of the Black community has rallied around Kamala's nomination as something that's very significant in terms of her representation. Uh, and, and of course, seeing more Black women uh, imagine themselves as, as being political. Um, several media outlets, though, have also been very aware that her Black identity is actually multicultural. Um, so you have several headlines, for instance, talking about, um, you know, the fact that she's making history in multiple ways. She's the first female, the first Black, and the first Asian American vice president. Um, there's been a, some sort of, some some pockets of these communities, whether Asian American or Black or women have actually had issues with how real she is, right? We've had many South Asians, for instance, particularly Indian media, interestingly, that sometimes say that Kamala is not really Indian at all. She's more Black and American than she is um, Indian American. Uh, and on the other hand, you have had some smaller pockets of even Black commentary that say that she's South Asian and not really Black, whatever that means, right? So you have had several opinion pieces, for instance, really push back against um, this idea that Kamala is, uh, you know, both Asian and Black, um, but that it actually reveals how America sort of struggles to talk about multiracial people and people with multicultural backgrounds. Um, and the fact that identity is complicated and she shouldn't have to choose just one. Some of these other headlines, um, this is a CNN one, for instance, um, also refer to how Kamala herself has sort of refused to be slotted in either or, you know, categories. Uh, Kamala calls herself purely American, right? The very fact that she is sort of representative of these different cultures, uh, immigrant cultures, uh, African-American culture, I think is significant in, in that she sees America as sort of this real conglomeration of identities. Um, and the fact that many people have complex roots to becoming American. So being a proud American is, is how she likes to present herself. Um, and we think that is very interesting that these tensions are sort of evident in many of the media commentaries around her uh, vice presidential candidacy. Uh, I'll let Radhika take yeah. over. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we thought we would, you know, separate these out. Um, you know, so uh, we've talked about just to kind of, uh, you know, present the journey that gets me here, which is we talked about, um, you know, how uh, she was seen as the first woman of color, the first black woman, right? So uh, keep those identity categories in mind, right? That, that because we are kind of looking at what happens to identity as the media invoke it, mm -hmm. you know? What are the identity categories they are giving Kamala and how does that make audiences think about these identity categories, right? So uh, in a way, the ways in which we think about race, gender, et cetera, is a two-way process. Um, the candidate has certain intentions, the media have certain intentions, and when those two meet, you, you have this construction of identity. Um, so we uh, were very curious as um, South Asians, as uh, Indians in the US to understand the Indian American response, right, to, uh, uh, to Kamala uh, Harris. So uh, here is a headline that says, feeling seen for the first time, Indian Americans cheer Kamala Harris's selection. So part of the issue for the Indian American community has been, um, you know, how do you slot Indian Americans racially? Who are they? They're not black, they're not Hispanic, they consider themselves brown, but what kind of brown is this? Because Hispanic Americans also and Latino Americans also call themselves brown, right? But this is a very different uh, type of brown. And in many ways, they fall through the cracks. You know, there's this perception, right? That they fall through the cracks in terms of thinking about uh, racial categories. And so, and some of that has been accompanied by feeling invisible. And a lot of scholars of Indian American racial identity in the US have ta talked about this concept of racial ambiguity. What do you do with the racial ambiguity? And how do you, um, 
you know, when you are ambiguous in that way, how do you mobilize? How do you push for rights, right? So that has been, um, you know, uh, kind of a problem, right? There is this category of the model minority, but that conceals, which is celebrates sort of Indian American accomplishments, but that often conceals the realities for many Indian Americans, you know, for example, think about the Simpsons, right? The convenience um, uh, the uh, store owner or the motel owner. These are categories that do not fit uh, the model minority. Yes. Um, so, so on the one hand, the previous headline kind of, you know, alluded to visibility and recognition, but there are also um, Indian American journalists themselves that's the other interesting thing. A lot of the journalists who are covering this identity also tend to be Indian American, right? And so here you have an Indian American journalist, Maithili Sampat Kumar, um, who says, um, you know, uh, Kamala Harris, yes, um, we recognize you, we know you're Indian American, but please don't assume you have our votes, right? Because remember the ways in which political candidates talk about their identities often is about mobilizing votes from this group or that group, right? And we don't need to only sort of uh, accuse Kamala Harris of this, but others as well, right? So Indian Americans have said, it's complicated, Don't you don't have our vote, right? Now, let's get to um, South Asian activists who are not Indian American, but Bangladeshis, for example, uh, have also uh, argued the same thing, right? Don't assume, and let me quickly talk about why this is. Um, Indian Americans, especially younger generations and activists as well from uh, other South Asian communities have been quite critical of Kamala's uh, record as a prosecutor, right? They've been critical of her, um, you know, so sometimes aligning herself with the police, sometimes not stepping up uh, to criticize um, racial profiling. They've also criticized her for um, not being uh, much more vocal about, um, you know, sort of defunding police, providing more resources for mental health, social work, uh, et cetera, rather than the police alone, right? So it's a pretty complicated relationship. Um, and so the Indian American response, you know, goes across the spectrum. There are those who have felt very, very happy about it, then there are those who've criticized it, just as you know, others have criticized, other people of color have criticized. Now, getting into the inner layers of her identity, right? So we're kind of peeling it away like an onion from the top layer, go getting to the inner layers, right? Um, <clears throat> the sort of one of the layers, of course, is South Asian, and then there's Indian, but some of the more less visible layers are that she's also Tamil and Brahmin. What is Tamil? Tamil is an identity that comes from uh, South India, and uh, both of us, I am, both of us are affiliated with that community. We speak Tamil, um, and she also belongs to a caste community, which is one of the top castes in India, the uppermost caste, and this is a caste that is particularly known for having access to a great deal of cultural capital, and I'll talk a little bit about that soon. This is an elite South Indian caste group. Among the diaspora, uh, more, many Americans um, would know these two names, um, Tamil Brahmins. That includes Sundar Pichai, who is CEO of Alphabet, uh, also Google, and then Indra Nui, who was um, the former CEO of PepsiCo. And lastly, I don't know how many of you would recognize the name Padma Lakshmi. She is a TV personality, host of Top Chef, but also has a new show called um, Taste of the Nation on Hulu. Uh, so these are some people, you know, celebrities that we would recognize. In general, the Tamil Brahmin community in the US is a highly educated professional class um, and um, typically overrepresented in STEM careers and in Silicon Valley. So this is part of Kamala's background. So um, what does this visibility mean and how has it emerged during her candidacy, right? She's seen as part of this Tamil American community. I don't know how many of you know who Mindy Kaling is, but Mindy Kaling is a well-known uh, comedian. She's appeared on um, movies. She also had her own show, right? And I don't know how many of you watched The Office, the, the show with Steve Carell. She was also on that. So very interestingly, 
uh, there was this very sort of uh, Tamil American moment where Kamala visited Mindy, uh, and this is Mindy's uh, house. This is a kitchen, and they made a South Indian snack called masala dosa together, right? And this moment that you see here is where Kamala has just finished chopping onions, and Mindy is quite astonished at her cooking skills, right? Where she's demonstrated, um, you know, that she can do this. And for many Indians, this is sort of a signature sort of, you are a good cook if you can chop your onions, right? Really fast and really small, okay? So this is sort of a legitimating moment. And one of the things Pallavi and I were talking about was how in so many ways, food becomes such a way of signaling our identity, right? And that is true, I would say of all Americans. Here is more recognition from the South Indian community, the Tamil community. Here is Padma Lakshmi, who I just mentioned, was so happy when um, Kamala right, was picked as vice president that she says, I literally have tears in my eyes. And Kamala used a word, chittis, and that means auntie in Tamil. And that is what has moved her to tears, right? To see a uh, Tamil word being uttered, you know, as part of this political landscape, right? A feeling of belonging and identification. Another celebrity, Mehdi Hassan, who has worked for The Intercept, who now works for NBC's Peacock streaming service. He's a journalist. Talk about complicated identity. He is formal, he's British but now American, lives in the US now, uh, but also Tamil and also Indian South Asian. And uh, he was so thrilled that, that Kamala talked about eating rice and yogurt, potato curry, dal, idli, right? All the foods that are so familiar to him. So, yeah. Um, so we're kind of going to conclude our presentation now, and we want to make sure you all have time for, que time for questions. So this is our sort of takeaways. Um, one of the issues, you know, that I quickly wanted to talk about, just from an academic standpoint, is there's a scholar called Loic Vacant, we hope we're pronouncing his name right, um, uh, who has talked about this concept called logic of the trial. And what does this logic of the trial mean? What it means is that often, whether candidates um, invoke their identities or the media cover their identities, there's a way in which um, you, know, you have these, it's almost like a puzzle, you name the identities, right? So-and-so is Black, Asian, Asian American, South Asian American, Tamil, right? And, and so uh, you know, these are often you know, just sort of brought up in ways that seem very static, right? And as though the identity is always already complete, right? There's no, it's, it's like if you raise it, that is what they are, okay? What we're arguing is that often what gets missed out in this is how people become certain identities, right? So for example, even in performing, sorry, today in doing this presentation, because I'm talking about Tamil, uh, because I'm talking about Brahmin, I have presented myself that way. But I am not that when I teach my classes. I rarely allude to these identities, right? When I'm teaching, I don't talk about myself a whole lot, rarely, right? Um, I teach my materials. Um, but today I'm performing this identity for you. So I am becoming that, right? And so this, this sort of more fluid becoming is often... Uh, hard to account for. And, and the reason we put up this photo here is that Kamala Harris herself has not spotlighted her Indian identity a whole lot. She's done it a lot more uh, after becoming vice president, by the way. Uh, even when she was running for president, it was much more muted. What she has emphasized much more is um, her black identity and her mother who's Indian, who never remarried, who left her black father when she was quite young, mm -hmm. I think she was about four or five, moved to Canada and interestingly raised her as a black girl and a black woman, right? And that is so interesting for us that an Indian woman of this elite background, right? Aligned herself with civil rights, uh, with the social justice movement. And then Kamala herself chose to go to Howard University. And in that process, again, invigorated her black identity herself in certain ways. And if you have all seen these images of her black sorority group, 
you know, with these pink uh, ribbons on their on their jackets, uh, endorsing her. You can see that invocation of black identity again. Uh, and I let Pallavi wrap this up now. Um, to add to that, one more thing that we have noticed that a lot of media co uh, com commentary seems to avoid or not quite know how to place um, is the role that class and class politics plays in, in how Kamala has become uh, a sort of African-American political candidate, right, with some Asian-American heritage as well. Uh, the media, for instance, are have, have noted that her parents have both been academics, but they both have PhDs. Um, and so it seems natural in some ways that Kamala would also end up being highly educated, herself becoming a lawyer. Um, these are kind of respectability politics that I think are very sort of critical to the Asian American community. Um, you will very rarely find Indian Americans who aren't invested in education, right? Many of them do get very advanced degrees um, and very sort of respectable intellectual professions. Um, and Kamala has followed in that heritage, but at the same time, much like Barack Obama, her mixed race heritage sort of gets amplified because she's also well-educated and presented in the media eye as someone who has a sort of right, the right kind of class background, right? Um, you have many working class or lower middle class African-American politicians who don't quite reach the same stature. And perhaps it's worth asking why both Barack Obama and her tend to be mixed race of immigrant heritage um, and of certain class backgrounds, and they have ended up in the highest political offices in this country, right? Um, and why is it, say, Stacey Abrams or, or uh, you know, some of the more newer sort of African-American, well, Shirley Chisholm as well, for instance, uh, might actually not have that degree of mobility within political circles. And I think it's, there's an, there's some sort of tension there that I think is interesting. Um, and lastly, we've spoken a lot about caste today. Caste within India itself is, is quite hierarchical and fairly oppressive. Um, I myself have sort of uh, moved towards anti-caste politics in India over the last few years, and that's what my dissertation tends to stem around. Um, and Kamala comes from a very elite caste. And in some ways, all of the identifications we're seeing in the media from Tamil Americans also involve people from the upper caste. So there's a certain cultural sort of recognition of her social status of caste within the American media that's interesting. But it also happens at a time in the US when caste is being used to also describe race. Um, Isabel Wilkerson has a book this year, for instance, called Caste. Uh, and, and, and that actually calls the American racial hierarchy a sort of racial caste system. Uh, and in some ways, she is also inspired and moved by how caste functions in India and how people have resisted caste in India um, in ways that America, African Americans can perhaps emulate. So there, there are interesting sort of, you know, uh, cross pollinating vectors I see here where you see race and caste as similar sorts of hierarchies um, and Kamala interestingly navigating both of them at a time when both are very visible in American culture, right? 2020 is a big year for anti-racist politics, but in India, it's also been a big year for anti-caste politics. Um, and so that the, the fact that she comes out at this moment, for, for me at least, is, is very interesting because both of these identities are seen as very critically sort of being analyzed in the media and becoming very much the focus of attention um, in, in ways that I think are worth thinking about quite deeply. So uh, we're happy to take questions. We'll stop here um, and we hope you, you found this useful and engaging yeah. in some ways. So one quick thing I wanted to say was this picture is Kamala's ancestral village mm -hmm. in uh, South India. I don't know that she's ever been to this village. Mm -hmm. When she's visited India, she's often gone to this very cosmopolitan place uh, in Chennai or Madras, you know, the city. Um, and in within that, a very, uh, a place called Besant Nagar. That is where she has gone the most. But here are these villagers celebrating um, you know, uh, her victory. And because Pallavi brought up Obama, I'll just say when Obama won, same thing, there were parts of Kenya where his father came from, you know, the sort of village where they celebrated as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will do, we will stop share now and see if you all have questions. Sorry, we ran a little bit over time. Please put it down to enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, do you have a few minutes to stay after as yes, we close absolutely. our presentation? Okay, we'll take a few questions after we formally close. But yes. thank you so much for your presentation today. And in honor of your uh, presentation, I kept keep saying that. I apologize. Uh, we'll be giving a donation to Amethyst House. So thanks again. And Sally, will you tell us about next week's? Not next week's. Three weeks from now, three weeks. Our next program. Yes, our next meeting is January 5th, 2021, and President Ashley Wesley will lead us in a club forum. Thanks so much. 
And Natalie, will you share our four-way test graphic, please, to close our meeting? Of the things we think, we think say, and, and do. do. First, First, is it the truth? To all. Second, is it fair? Third, 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 third build a good good will, better friendship. friendships. Fourth, fourth, fourth beneficial, 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 beneficial,